The riverbeds. Wow, this is louder than I expected. <laughs> so, how are y'all doing this morning? Good, good. How many of you had the opportunity to make it to General Assembly on Friday? Or tuned in online? All right. That's almost 100% in here. That's great. So we're going to go through just a little bit of a presentation. And then we're just, we just want to open up for conversation, if that's OK, and kind of hear back from you uh, what's, what's on your mind and uh, where do we need to go forward. So let me, and this is cool. I, <laughs> I like that. I have to get me one of these. So first of all, I want to introduce, because some of you probably haven't had the opportunity to meet our new provost, although she's not that new anymore. She's been with us for nine months. Uh, but she is doing an outstanding job and making a real difference and a real impact in looking at the future, how the delivery of education is made, and what we need to do uh, to bring more of the community in. So I want to introduce, and she's going to talk later, but introduce our provost, Dr. Monique Humphrey. So one of, you know, one of the things that is critical to us, <clears throat> and you'll see it when we talk more about uh, the chancellor's priorities, but equity, inclusion, diversity, social justice, is a critical part of ACC. And uh, she's already making a big difference in taking steps to make sure that we are equitable and inclusive uh, throughout the college. Who did that? Did you do that? OK. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, she's the designated oop person. So. You know, Hayes Campus just came up live, what was it, eight years ago, about? And uh, I don't know if you all remember how that came about, but as a result of annexation uh, for this area, for the Kyle, the Buda area, then uh, what we do is we have a facilities uh, corporation uh, and a public facilities corporation. As a result of the new taxes that were going to come into the district as a result of annexation, then our public facilities corporation uh, was allowed to go ahead and sell bonds, and we used those to build this building. So this was phase one. And then when we got ready to go to the voters in 2014, then we had the other piece, uh, which is the law enforcement. Academy. And so that was a part of a geo bond election that happened. So now we're looking at, and I'm going to get into it in just a minute, what about the 2022 geo bond? And what does that mean for the Hayes campus? But, you know, the Public Safety Training Center, uh, the Pathways Program with Texas State University. And uh, I don't know if you know how that came about. But it came about as a result of some jealousy. So we started the, a program with the University of Texas at Austin a year before the Pathways program. It's called the PACE program. PACE program was a concept developed by President, then President Powers at the University of Texas at Austin. And I, we had a, a meeting after a meeting, uh, just the two of us, and we were talking about what can we do different together. Uh, to really improve the numbers of students who are transferring, successfully transferring from ACC to UT. And how can we open the doors? Because UT only takes the top 6% of the high school graduating classes. And in the state of Texas, you know, if you're in your top 10%, you're supposed to be able to go to the college of choice. Uh, but UT only takes the top six. So what? happens to the 7, 8, 9, and 10 percentile students that wanted to go to UT. We made the pathway through ACC to allow that to happen. And that was called the PACE program. And it was basically housed at the Rio Grande campus. Well, Texas State heard about that program and they said, what about us? 
Uh, we don't want to focus on the top 10%, but what about students that want to go to Texas State that are not quite ready for the rigor, so they need some developmental assistance uh, before they're ready for all the coursework uh, at Texas State. So we created the Pathways Program with Texas State for students that wanted to go to Texas State but needed some developmental help. And, but one of the great things with Texas State is they said they can live in our dormitories uh, and we will bus them to the Hayes campus. And so that started that the year after. And that's been a good relationship both with UT Austin and uh, Texas State. So uh, this fall we have 1,100 students enrolled here uh, and hopefully we'll continue to grow that. So what we're looking at is the 2014 bonds. What did we do? I talked about that. That was the Law Enforcement Academy. And then we also, uh, there are different funding mechanisms that we can use at ACC to build buildings or to renovate existing buildings. So one of those ways is to go to the voters like we did in 2014 and like we're going to do in 2022. And we can ask the voters to support us uh, by approving general obligation bonds. And we sell those bonds and then we build new buildings or we can renovate existing. So that's one way. Another way is through revenue bonds. And that is basically we tax our students. So we add additional fees to our students. We sell bonds and those fees pay for those bonds like a mortgage over a 25 to 30 year period. Um, another way is called tax maintenance notes. Tax maintenance notes are paid by the taxpayers, but you don't have to go to the public for approval. Uh, and a tax maintenance note cannot be used, however, for new facilities. It can only be used to refurbish or repair existing facilities. So for the first time a year ago, we sold tax maintenance notes uh, for about just over $80 million. And we've been putting that into different facilities uh, throughout the district uh, to improve and repair, because we've got some very old facilities uh, that needed a lot of work. So that's what we've been using that for. So now we get into the 2022 bond. And we've got some brochures that we're going to pass out to you that talks about it. But we, our board approved $770 million to be put on the ballot in November for the voters in our taxing district to vote on. And that is, did I do that? You did that. Oh. <laughs> I didn't get to do that. Okay. <laughs> so um, we kind of split it up between the north, central, and south regions, and that's what we're trying to do, especially for when we talk about high cost programs like nursing and the health sciences, we want to make sure that uh, students in the north section of our service area, the central section, and the south section, that they have opportunity to attend those. What we don't have in the South is we don't have nursing and health sciences programs to offer them. And so in this bond, the 770 million, you'll see that a lot of it is going into the South. Uh, two major areas that what you're gonna see, 100 million will go here to the Hayes campus and that's for a nursing and health sciences center. Uh, dedicated to that. So we'll look at all of the programs that are gonna go in here, but I can tell you that nursing will be one of them. With this bond, what it allows us to do is double the numbers of nurses that we're putting into our community on an annual basis. So right now we graduate somewhere in the neighborhood of 350 to 380 nurses uh, every year. So that means we can probably almost get it up to 800 per year. Uh, going into our hospitals, clinics uh, throughout the district. So 100 million comes here. Elsewhere in the South, uh, you probably remember that back in the 2014 bond issue, we land banked 
some property out by the airport. Uh, it's 1.30 and uh, next to the airport and kind of across from where the uh, penitentiary is, but we're not that close to it. But uh, in that area close to the airport, we bought about 125 acres. Uh, we recently sold about 48 acres to the Texas Department of Emergency Management. So they will construct their home for the state of Texas or the Texas Department of Emergency Management will be adjacent to us on that property. It will, a couple of things. One is it was absolutely necessary that somewhere like that, uh, because they have to respond to floods throughout, such as in Houston, uh, they have to respond quickly. And so they have to have a place where all of their equipment, everything is housed and can take it out. The great thing for ACC, it's gonna allow us uh, a lot of training opportunities, uh, but also a leveraging of the cost of building our campus because they will be bringing in some of the infrastructure. And so we can coordinate that and reduce the cost so we can put more of our dollars into the construction of facilities. So uh, they're a good partner. Uh, for those of you that, that don't know, they're a part of Texas A&M University. <clears throat> and as a Longhorn, that is hard. That was hard to negotiate with Texas A&M, but, but they are really a good partner. Uh, so we're looking forward to that. They probably will start construction uh, within the year. Uh, so you'll see some movement activity out there. Uh, so 200 million of the 770, actually because it's a new campus, no infrastructure whatsoever, it's all agricultural land right now. So 200 million will go into that facility uh, and starting that. It's gonna be a workforce facility. It is very close in proximity to Tesla. So advanced manufacturing, welding, skilled trades, automotive technology, uh, all of those are gonna go into that campus. Um, then we've got in the central region, the north region, those are all covered in your handouts, so I won't cover those. One thing I might tell you though, let me go back, I love doing that. So one thing I'll tell you though, I cannot advocate for or against the bond issue uh, at any time um, because I'm considered on the payroll all the time. Uh, you can advocate just not during college hours and you cannot use college resources at all. So that includes email. But you can, outside of that, you can advocate all as, as much as you want. So chancellor's priorities, and if you were uh, attended the General Assembly, you will have heard some of this, uh, but I want uh, Dr. Humphrey to come up and talk about what's going on with the chancellor's priorities, kind of go over that. But before we move to that, there is a major announcement that just happened this weekend that I'm gonna ask Brett to talk about. So over the last several years, you know that Austin Community College has won best of for nursing. And that's been a category in higher education. Well, this year that was not a category. Instead, they made it all universities and all colleges. I'm happy to announce the winner for 2020, is it one or two? It's 20, I know it's 2022, but I didn't know if it was back or forward. She thinks I'm insane. So the winner for 2022 is Austin Community College. This is my favorite part. Finalist number one is A&M. Finalist number two is UT. So congratulations, y'all. That is not just the community go out, going out and voting. That is indicative of everyone in here who is either taking classes or in the classroom or planning and supporting our students. So, let me just say, kudos. 
Thank you, Rick. That is cool. Um, also, if you are at the General Assembly, then you heard uh, Elizabeth, one of our students, uh, who, who was a Black Hawk helicopter pilot, even though she's only, I mean, kind of dainty. And I'm thinking, I'm Black Hawk, and, I mean, just, and a Chinook uh, helicopter pilot. Uh, she was incredible. That whole panel was just incredible. That is my favorite thing to do, uh, is to interview students and learn more about them and let them tell their stories, why they love ACC, uh, what made a difference, why they came here. Uh, but if, if you listen to Elizabeth's story, you know, she already had a bachelor's degree from the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, but she came back to ACC, and she's not going to stop with one degree from us, but she's, I think she's working on two or three uh, with us. Uh, just an incredible, uh, incredible person, uh, as all of them were. But also, if you listen to it, two of those panelists are single parents. Uh, and one of the things that is driving us forward is to look at the students today and what their needs are. Um, and it is a different day and age. It is, I'll tell you, much different than when I was a student, um, because I can't remember that far back. Uh, but the challenges and the needs of students today are so incredibly different. Uh, and we have to be concerned about that. And that's one of the things we need to talk about uh, for the Hayes campus is what types of services do we have to make sure that we include for our students that they'll be successful. One of the things we've been working on is child care. Uh, in, over the last four years, uh, our Board of Trustees, through our budget process, has put $300,000 a year into child care, um, kind of like scholarships, uh, for students who need that additional help to stay in school. Uh, also, in this year's budget, uh, we set aside $1 million to take a look at a pilot project to create a child care center on one of our campuses and use that as a model for the future and make sure it works before we start to scale it. But that's one of the areas that we, we need to make a difference in. Uh, another thing that I'll tell you that we're looking at right now uh, because of uh, affordable housing is an issue is that uh, we're actually in conversation and taking a look at can we be a player in providing affordable housing for students uh, and possibly for our workforce uh, which includes our workforce uh, our employees so we'll be looking at that during the next six to eight months uh, and making some decisions on how we can move forward with that also, you know that uh, you know from the surveys that we've done with Trellis Foundation, we know that uh, food insecurity is a major issue also with our students. So what can we do differently uh, to help our students and meet their needs, uh, such as food pantries? But it, it can go beyond food pantries. And so we need to look and, and take a look at what opportunities do we have and how can we leverage with other community partners such as the Central Texas Food Bank. Uh, and you know, there, there is nothing that we can do really by ourselves. It depends on working in partnership, collaboration with, with uh, community partners. So that's what we're gonna have to focus on. So now let me turn it over to Dr. Humphrey uh, to talk about the Chancellor's priorities. Right. So uh, let me just start by saying I'm so excited to be here on the Hayes campus. This is my first time visiting the campus and I'm just uh, really excited to be able to meet some of you uh, that I haven't had a chance to meet at some of the other visits. I'm always impressed with the work that you're doing. And so um, Dr. Rhodes had asked earlier about who was able to attend our General Assembly. So if you were able to attend, uh, you were able to hear Dr. Rhodes' inspirational words as well as hear uh, from our keynote speaker. 
And so uh, I just want to touch on that as we start to talk about the priorities, because I think that frames part of this conversation. Uh, what was interesting to me about our key, keynote speaker, uh, Gerd is a futurist. And so if you're familiar with futurists, you know, their business is not predicting the future. It's to study the research and understand the trends and be able to make actionable insights based on those trends. And what we saw from his uh, keynote, the world is changing and is changing quickly. I think that's a good way to sum it up. Uh, one of the quotes, um, one of the things that I've attributed to him that he's been saying for a while is, we will experience more change in the next 10 years than we've experienced in the past 100. And if you just sit in that, that's it can be overwhelming. But one thing I like about GERD is he keeps it in a positive um, uh, format so that you don't get discouraged by the change, but you're actually energized about it. And so that's one of the things that I love about working here. Uh, I was attracted to ACC because of the spirit of innovation and the excellence in teaching and learning. And so when I think about what the future looks like, I'm excited because we don't have to inherit a future that's created by somebody else. It doesn't have to be pushed down on us. We don't have to live in this dystopian society, but we actually get to create the future that we want. So when you look at it that way, we're co-creating the future right now. That's what's exciting. So we're co-creating together. And so when we think about the priorities, uh, the chancellor was, uh, you know, one of the things I love about Dr. Rhodes is he challenges us and he inspires us. It's always aspirational. You know, he pushes us, he wants us to be the best community college in the galaxy, right? We know that. So the chancellor's priorities are a way for us to co-create together. And so when you think about these six areas of focus, this is ways for us to be aligned and have cohesion across the district so that we're all working together for student success. And so uh, everybody, everybody in this room has a part in driving student success. Everyone here is a partner in co-creating our future for Austin Community College. So it's actually pretty exciting. So um, when we think about the six, so the first one is a standalone. If you think of each one of these as a theme, yes, equity is a theme but it's the lens in which we approach all of our work. Uh, we look at everything through an equity lens. So what does that mean? When we think about student success, when you think about the academic master plan that we have, we are dedicated and intentional about creating personalized approaches to learning, right? We need to make sure that each student has exactly what they need to thrive. And that's gonna be different for every student. Uh, Dr. Rhodes mentioned equity, a sense of belonging, social justice. When we think about personalized learning, um, understanding that each student comes with different experiences, they have a different background, and each student may need something different. It's our job to listen, to pay attention, and to be observant so we can understand what does this particular student need to thrive. And you all are doing that in an amazing way already. Uh, one of the things that we've been uh, more intentional about uh, ACC has been an early proponent of embracing neurodiversity, but we're being explicit about it now. And so what do I mean by neurodiversity? People learn differently. They think differently. They work differently. But how do we celebrate that so that no one feels like they're being tolerated, but they're being celebrated for their differences? Um, and when I was growing up, things were not as PC. My, uh, <laughs> my godson says, gosh, you all were so mean. And I'm like, no, that was just the way things were when I was growing up. But when I was growing up, they called uh, different learning styles learning disabilities. And that is definitely from a deficit-based approach. To me, uh, when we think about neurodiversity, we're talking about celebrating the different ways in which people learn and express themselves. And uh, the actual strength, um, I have quite a few people very close to me uh, that are neurodivergent, and I call them their superpowers because it allows them to see things that other people may not see. And so when we uh, think about how we come together as teams, uh, being intentional about supporting each other, because that allows us to see opportunities differently, that allows us to respond differently, and that allows us to come up with more creative solutions in how we serve our students. Um, so just a statistic that we'll put out there, 20% of the incoming students are diagnosed as neurodivergent. 
Those are the ones that are diagnosed. How many have not been properly diagnosed? So at least one fifth of our students are neurodivergent. How do we make sure that we're creating an environment where they can learn as well? And when we talk about equity and intersectionality, imagine if you're gay, black, and neurodivergent, how that might look different for you and how you show up in the classroom and how you may need to be supported. So understanding uh, if you follow a Sarah Goldrick Robb and her real college movement, uh, when they talked about housing and housing insecurity specifically, uh, neurodivergent students and uh, LGBTQIA students were some of the students that had, had the highest incidence of housing insecurity. So again, thinking about uh, our teaching and learning excellence, and we do an amazing job of creating exceptional learning environments, but it's hard for a student to focus on what's going on in your classroom if they're trying to survive. So we have to put Maslow's before Bloom's. We are definitely focused on Bloom's taxonomy, but we have to make sure that students are in a safe place and they feel a sense of psychological safety and they're not just focused on how they're gonna survive. And so uh, that's what's, when you think about, uh, uh, one of the reasons I'm excited about my role is because it has, uh, it's equally focused on student services and instruction. You know, our student services professionals are making sure that we're supporting the students, giving them what they need so that they can show up and be ready to thrive. And our instructional facilities, our uh, uh, faculty members and instructional professionals are working in tandem with our student services to ensure that the students have what they need. There's a pilot uh, that's starting this semester to ensure that the faculty members have access to the resources that they need because they're, they're getting more and more requests from students or they're seeing opportunities for students that have challenges and they want to know how to how to support them. So we're going to make sure that they have easy access to the right support uh, mechanisms for those students. So I mentioned equity. Again, that's the lens in which we look at all of our student success work. Uh, but specifically, some of the, the reason we've called it out as a separate theme is we want to be able to track and monitor our progress with all of our equity work. Some of the key high level uh, items, now again, we approach everything with an equity lens, but two of the big things that we're looking at is our faculty hiring. We know that the percentage of students that we have that are Hispanic continues to grow, um, as well as all of our uh, groups. Austin is continuing to be a great place, one of the fastest growing places in the world, specifically the South Travis area and this Hayes campus is a fast growing area. But we want to make sure that the students are able, uh, we want to continue to have diverse hiring of our faculty. So that's going to be a key tenant, an area that we will continue to focus on. Another area is expanding our TR TRHT Center. So if you're familiar uh, with the Truth Racial Healing and Transformation Center, we want to continue to have programming there so we can continue to do some of that difficult work. Uh, equity work is not easy. Conversations about race are not easy. Conversations about uh, growth and progress are not easy. But our TRHT Center, uh, again, just for those that may not be familiar, we were one of the first 10 colleges and universities in the nation to have a TRHT Center. That's amazing. So we're gonna continue to work on expanding the programming for that center to allow us to continue to grow and expand and be a national leader uh, in terms of equity. Uh, so the second theme is enrollment. What we're looking at here is oh, how can we be intentional about creating, um, expanding our enrollment efforts? So we have a fiduciary responsibility to serve our service area. Are we doing absolutely everything we can to make sure that every student that wants an opportunity for education and training is able to get that? So that's our focus on expanding our enrollment efforts. Uh, this will include our work with our, our consultant on a strategic enrollment management plan and uh, then thinking about how we uh, continue to apply continuous process improvement to our enrollment funnel. So uh, we all know we're celebrating, we're going into our 50th year celebration and that's amazing, but we wanna think, make sure that we're applying that continuous process improvement lens to everything that we do. Uh, now, one of the things within enrollment and modernization is our focus on our ERP system and our SIS, our student information system. So we know that we have to modernize, that's a given, but one of the opportunities that you have with SIS and any ERP module is you can either take it as is 
looking at your existing processes and doing that exactly the same way in your ERP. Or you can take a step and pause and say, let's examine our processes. Is there a chance for business process re-engineering? And what do I mean by that? I threw a lot of vocabulary words out there, but it's really a chance for us to think about, okay, when the college opened 50 years ago, are we doing the same things the same way? Because we had a triplicate form in 1971, and now we've done the equivalent of a triplicate carbon form in a computer system? Or have we really thought about, do we need to rethink how we serve our students? When they come in, do we make them turn left and turn right and turn left and do it 16 times because that's what we did in 1972? Or is there a chance for us to rethink? It makes me think about the example uh, my mother always told me when I first got married. Uh, she told me the story about uh, the woman getting married and they gave her the pot to cook a pot roast in. And she said, what's the first thing you do? She said, you cut off the end of your roast and throw it away. And long story short, as they evolved in the story, she asked her mother and her mother and her mother, why do you cut off the end? And the grandmother said, that's stupid. I cut off the end because my pot was too small. You know, and now you've got a bigger pot and you're still throwing away part of the roast. So it's a chance for us to really think about what makes sense. We want to be intentional uh, because remember I said we're co-creating the future together. We want to make sure that as we strive to be the best community college in the galaxy, that we're a leader, that we're an exemplar for how we serve our students. We want to create those absolute best learning environments. But it's not just the learning environment. It's that customer service focus. It's hospitality. We call it Southern hospitality. But we want every student to have that experience. You know, if they told you that, um, I don't know, um, Queen Elizabeth's grandchild was going to be coming and living in the Austin area, and they, let's just say they were 21, and they were going to be going to our college, I bet people would roll out the red carpet to make sure that they would get good treatment because it's going to be on the news and blah, blah, blah. Every single student deserves a royal red carpet treatment. Every single student. It doesn't matter what their name is. It doesn't matter who their parents are. They're here because they want to improve their quality of life. And we want to treat them that way. So it doesn't matter if they're connected or not. We want to make sure that they're getting that red carpet treatment. So that's why we, we're going to think strategically and intentionally about how we serve our students, how we may need to rethink what we do. You know, uh, I treat everything as a hypothesis. You know, so I guess it's a science background. I think it would be better if we did X. But we're going to look at the data and see is, is the efficacy there. It may not be. We'll see. But we're open to new ideas and new ways of thinking. So um, I mentioned enrollment. That's making sure that we are removing barriers for students to get here. If they want to come, we want them there, here, and we want them to feel welcome. Uh, the third one is learning and retention. We are a national model for excellence in teaching and learning, and we want to keep it that way. The worst thing that you could do is start patting yourself on the back and getting cocky and say, ha, huh, nobody teaches like we do. No, that's not us. We understand that in order to remain relevant, we have to continually apply those same principles. If we're asking our students, the World Economic Forum says that students have to be adaptable and agile and resilient. How can we ask our students to be something that we're not? So we have to be adaptable and agile and resilient. So as we think about all of that, that means we're a learning institution. As we are a learning institution, we will continually challenge ourselves. I don't have all the answers. Brett doesn't have all the answers. Dr. Rose doesn't have all the answers. But guess what? Together, all of us, I think we can do pretty well together. Uh, I'm, I'm proud to say that I work with a lot of intelligent people. And together, you know, that's the beauty of it. From your frontline workers, to your faculty, to your student services professionals, uh, to uh, even us administrators. You know, but between all of us, we can come up with some really good solutions for our students. And so uh, under learning and retention, we've got several key focus areas. We're going to be looking at strategic scheduling. What does that mean? We're going to make sure that our scheduling is demand driven. What does that mean? What do students want? 
if students are desiring more, if this particular student feels like they would do better in an in-person environment, we want to make sure if they want to come to this campus that they can build the schedule that they need at this campus. If they live close to Riverside and they want to take in-person classes, they should be able to build that schedule. If they want a hybrid schedule, they should be able to build that. We are putting the technology in place to assist our faculty and deans and department chairs to be able to build that robust schedule. Right now, it's very manual. We want to take some of the manual overhead off of our faculty so that we can build the schedule that we need for our students. Also under our learning uh, and retention bucket, we're looking at high flex, expanding our high flex opportunities. What does that mean? For the students, um, now our GIS department, they were our early adopters in uh, high flex. High flex just means hybrid, um, hybrid flexible. Uh, for us, that means building, uh, what I loved about our GIS team, they said they built it from a pedagogy perspective as an online class that had face-to-face -face participants. So they wanted to make sure if you're online, you have a premium experience. And we know that life happens to our students. If a child is sick, now they can attend from home, and it's not a second class experience. They don't have to miss two classes because a child is sick. They can continue to make progress in our class. We know that 80% of our students that get Bs and above have uh, had record attendance. Attendance is directly correlated with their outcomes for the class. So by having these high flex, additional high flex classes, we're giving our students more opportunities to thrive. Wellness. Now this is one that is probably new as a title, but it's something that we've embraced for a while. Wellness means we are concerned about you as a human, human first. And what I love about this, this is applying that human first lens internally and externally. Some people say we're a student ready college. Yes, we are, but ACC has been a student ready college for a long time. What this means is we're also an employee ready college. We may not have it all figured out, but we're being intentional about getting there. I always tell people it's important for us. We are in, we are all, whether you realize it or not, whether you consider yourself spiritual or not, you have um, a calling when you work in higher ed. We have a calling to serve our students. You cannot pour from an empty cup. Let me say that again. You cannot pour from an empty cup. So we have to practice radical self-care. What does that mean? We've seen a lot during this last couple of years. Since March 2020, our, all of our worlds have changed and been upended. Mental health challenges are on the incline. I just saw a study last week that the largest percentage of growth for inpatient care from a mental health perspective is from 11 to 15-year-old children. It's, it's affecting everyone. So I say all of that to say, we have to practice radical self-care, but as an institution, we have to be intentional about caring for each other. That means as I get to know you and you get to know me, it's not just, hey, good morning, but I'm listening to see, you know, she always smiles. She wasn't smiling this morning. She seems a little bit heavier. Is there something that I can do to show up for you so that you can show up and serve our students? We have a calling and we understand that, but you can't compartmentalize your life so much that you just show up for work and leave your personal life at home. It doesn't work that way. We're integrated as humans. That means we have wholeness and we want you to be whole. So how do we care for each other and how do we care for our students? All of that is in our wellness umbrella. The fourth, one, two, three, four, fifth block, uh, fifth theme is modernization. So I mentioned our ERP work, our SIS work, uh, also, all of the other things that fall under that umbrella. Uh, understand over, since March of 2020, been a lot of changes, but people's expectations have changed in regards to technology and simplicity. What you accepted, what students accepted as an online experience in March of 2020 is different from what they expect now. They expect us to, con to continue to raise the bar. Uh, people, ex they got used to two-day delivery with Amazon. And when you talk about building an online marketplace, people want it to function like Amazon because that's what they've gotten used to. Does that mean it's easy? No, they've put millions and millions of dollars into that development. But what does that mean for us? It means we have to be more intentional about the technology that we utilize and leverage. 
more intentional about how we develop workflows, how we serve each other, how we communicate with our students. Modernization is huge, but we have to prioritize the things that bring the most value to us. Uh, one of the big things under that I mentioned previously, our ERP work. So we're uh, launching our SIS ERP module. So there's a lot of work on that. It's going to involve everybody. And so I'm sharing that ahead of time. Uh, I can't say this enough. We need your voices as we ask for volunteers, as we ask you to serve. Please consider this as a key area because you think about how we implemented uh, finance and the HR modules for Workday. Your ERP system is only as good as the workflows used to build it. So if you don't have functional users on those teams, it's built by IT people that don't know your business. So who's going to build the module for registration if we don't have registration people at the table? We need the people who are doing the work to work on these projects. I can't stress that enough. That's why it's a district-wide priority. Uh, the last one, it's a lot of stuff, and I guess they couldn't fit it on the slide. <laughs> Sustainability is how I'll uh, summarize it. It's our work on accreditation. It's our work on the legislative items, the geo bond. Uh, but just as a reminder, we have our SACS uh, reaccreditation on-site visit in October. That's huge. So all of the work that goes into that, again, it takes everybody. So if we're asking last minute for people to be involved, this is why, because it's critical for us. So I've summarized, it took a lot of words, but these are the things that the chancellor has identified as the six themes that will help us co-create our future together. So I think, all right, oh, okay. Um, again, what have we learned over the last few years? Um, COVID and from March, 2020 and on has taught us a lot. Um, we're teaching in new ways and we're supporting our students in new ways. And so the thing about it, despite all of these changes, student success still remains at the core. We're still laser focused on student success. We've just expanded our vocabulary a little bit in how we do it. Like I said, embracing neurodiversity. ACC has always done that. We have the Access Autism Student Group, which is a national leader. But we're just in, in expanding our vocabulary a little bit so that we can uh, effectively communicate to our students and to our outside community all about all of this amazing work that we're doing. And we're continue, continuing to support our students in new ways. Thank you. So uh, we're continuing to learn to teach in new ways. I mentioned the high flex classrooms and the reason for them, uh, strategic scheduling. Also our bachelor's degrees. We received authorization from the state. Our first uh, bachelor's degree was in nursing. Again, Dr. Rhodes mentioned the desire to double our capacity. Uh, with our bachelor's degree in nursing, uh, we are continuing to work on that. And the, with the expansion of our facilities to support this, this will help as well. Our second bachelor's degree was in uh, software development. And then we were just approved for our third bachelor's degree in advanced manufacturing. Uh, our uh, faculty and team are working on the next bachelor's degree, which is in cybersecurity. They're currently working with our advisory boards and looking to submit the curriculum in December for a bachelor's degree in cybersecurity. So we're continuing to look at ways that we can leverage the strengths of our existing curriculum and build on that and expand our students and provide them with the robust programming and curriculum that they need. All right. And our QEP. So I mentioned our SAC site visit in October. Uh, our focus, and this is uh, led by our college members, faculty, staff, and administrators, we voted for this topic. And it is it was digital fluency for today's jobs. It's been renamed to digital fluency and innovation. It's understanding the world that we live in and understanding that we have to move beyond uh, digital literacy, saying that you understand uh, technology but digital fluency. Think about it as a language. When I first went to Venezuela, I took a couple of Spanish classes and I could read, but I was so nervous about talking because I thought they would hear my Southern draw and I just was very uncomfortable talking. It's a whole different thing to say you're fluent in another language, right? But we need our students to have that digital fluency because the jobs demand it. When they go on interviews, it's expected of them. I, I saw, um, 
uh, expert uh, the, in HR talking about resumes. And they said, if you're putting on your resume fluent in Word and Excel, she said, I'm looking at you as if you're an artifact and a relic and a dinosaur. Because <laughs> she said, okay, and, <laughs> you know, they want to see Salesforce. They want to see all of the new technology that's being used. So our students have to have this additional, additional digital fluency so they can be ready for the jobs of today and the jobs of tomorrow. So understanding this is across our curriculum, regardless of your discipline, regardless of your area of study, all of our students have to have that digital fluency. What I'm so excited about, this QEP team is amazing. They have come up with 16 micro credentials that are available to all of our students at no charge. So they can build up their digital fluency. They can go on an interview and, and speak to the things that they're able to do, not just theory, but what they're able to do. And there'll be some campus conversations on the QEP October 6th as well. If you want more information and dig deeper, uh, we'll have all of that on October 6th. As we look at teaching in new ways, uh, one of the other projects that we are uh, working on is faculty advising. We have a group of completion counselors that were in student affairs that have transitioned over to the instructional side. And so they, are, they will be working with our adjunct faculty members to create additional uh, advising for our students that's based on their area of study. So we're really excited about this. Again, another way to serve our students where they are. And uh, we are already offering eight-week courses, but we're looking at expanding how many eight-week courses we have. Again, as we think about how do we uh, apply that continuous process improvement lens to the work that we have, with the eight-week modalities, well, we have been awarded a grant. We are a member of a um, Texas TACC, Texas Association of Community Colleges. We are part of the grant to expand eight-week courses. And so uh, Dr. Rhodes has been working with the president of Odessa. Odessa is our mentor college. They are a national leader in eight-week modalities. So we're looking at how we can expand the number of eight-week courses that we have. And so this grant gives us a year to plan this work. So this is an opportunity for our faculty to work peer to peer with faculty from other institutions that have already done this to learn what works best, what didn't work, how can we do this well? How can we set this up for success for our student services professionals, for our financial aid professionals, for everyone to work with peers from institutions that have already done this so that we can expand in a way with intentionality. And so as we look at how we support our students in new ways, uh, Dr. Rhodes mentioned our child care services. Our trustees have been so supportive. Uh, they embedded within our budget this year a billion dollars to look at how we expand our child care services. Remember I said, as we think about wellness internally and externally, we know that our students are facing challenges with food, housing, and transportation. But now, uh, if you were able to uh, attend the General Assembly or watch online and saw that student panel, how many of those students talked about how critical their, their, students, their student scholars, their parent scholars, they've got all these challenges, but child care is one of those critical things that's needed for our parent scholars to be effective. Healthcare services. I mentioned the mental health challenges. We're going to be uh, offering uh, clinics in conjunction with Baylor Scott and White. Um, do, just doing more intentional ways of serving uh, our students and our faculty and staff to ensure that we're addressing the mental health concerns. And then also the new Welcome Center. So uh, I want to make sure I'm clear about this because I realize I didn't say this Friday during General Assembly. Uh, we shared a video on the Welcome Center. Uh, the new Welcome Center, we will pilot it at Highland, but I think it's important to say Highland is our training ground. It doesn't mean that it'll only be at Highland. We'll launch it first at Highland, learn what works, learn what resonates most with our students, and then that will be the model for how we have our student services on every campus. So we will adapt the Welcome Center concept to every single campus. So, um, so what's so exciting about this, this will be the one-stop shop. I'm looking at our space over here, and I know you all have done a great job on uh, student pantries, uh, but we want to make sure we uh, expand our student support services so that we're able to meet the students where they are, whether it's expanding the grab and go section so they can grab food when they need it. Again, Maslow's before blooms, I can't say that enough. So we wanna make sure that we're intentional on every campus, on our welcome spaces, because that's the first thing that the students encounter. 
We want to make sure that it's easy for them when they come in so they understand when they walk on campus, if they've never been here before. If you're the first person in your, college, in your family to go to college, all of the academic speak, we, we create a whole glossary for people to understand. It can be very intimidating. We want the Welcome Center to be that place where you feel welcome and you're not afraid and you're not afraid to ask questions. But more importantly, it's sort of intuitive to help you on this journey. We want you to be successful. We want to put the guardrails, everything that we're doing, I think of it like this. We want to create a, the ACC of the future, in my mind, has uh, bumper rails. You know, if you went, used to go bowling and they had the bumper rails uh, so you can't roll a gutter ball, that's how we want our approach to education to be. We don't want students to be able to roll a gutter ball. We want to put those guardrails up to help them be successful. What are the things that we know that make students derail? Let's put some things in to address those so that we can remove barriers for our students. We want them to be successful. We are excited for them. And we want to do everything in our power to be successful, for them to be successful. So the Welcome Center will start at Highland, but we'll learn from those principles and apply them to our other campuses. I'll talk for a while, Dr. Rhodes. All right. I don't know about you. I love listening to you, Dr. Humphrey. Uh, you know, every time I listen to her, I learn something new, uh, several something new uh, about what we're doing. I uh, also want to take the, a minute to introduce an ACE fellow that's being with us uh, for this next year, uh, Desmond Lewis. So he, uh, he works at uh, Houston Community College, and he's going to be coming back and forth and uh, spending some time with us. Uh, and learning from us, but also giving some input to us as to how we can become better. Uh, so now I want to open it up if you've got any questions um, or comments. We'd love to hear from you. While we're doing that, let me just uh, say one thing, uh, and that is, you know, what I love about Dr. Humphrey She's bringing so much to us that, uh, you know, ha she has experience from Houston Community College as a campus president, but she also uh, spent time at Cuyahoga Community College in Cleveland and worked a lot on the development of workforce programs uh, throughout uh, the state of Ohio, but also has experience from industry that she brings to us. Uh, so she understands how to talk to industry partners so I worked for Healthcare uh, Corporation of America, HCA, uh, for a number of years. Uh, her background is really in software development, uh, IT, uh, and also was at Bridgestone. Or, yeah, Bridgestone. Uh, worked for them for a Eight number years. of years. So um, I am so glad, and we are so blessed to have her with us. Thank you, Dr. Got a so question questions now. Now you've had a chance to think about it. Hello, uh, John Breed. Uh, I'm over at Highland Campus uh, in the TV studio. Maybe you saw me at the General Assembly on the video. I'm, I'm a superstar now. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> the question I had was uh, regarding healthcare services. Uh, will we have uh, like places a student could go if they're not feeling so well that day? On, on, on the campuses, places that, where they could be treated? That's what we're working on. Uh, our first step in that is a mental uh, health center uh, that will be on the Eastview campus. And that's opening up uh, in collaboration with Dell uh, Medical Center. So that's gonna, that is actually open up now. Um, and so that's our first launch in that. We're in conversation with uh, Baylor Scott and White but also with, with Seton and uh, with uh, St. David to talk about what are the other opportunities on other campuses that we can bring uh, together and how can we leverage the cost of doing that. Uh, and so that, that's what we're working through right now. Uh, I would say the one that uh, uh, we've worked the closest with lately, uh, as Dr. Embry mentioned, is Baylor Scott and White. Uh, they're making a major move into Central Texas, um, that they didn't really have a presence 
uh, prior to about four or five years ago. Uh, so they're aggressive in looking at new ways to offer services, and, and so we hope to be one of those new ways uh, in collaboration with them. So we're working through some of the fine points. Of, you know, how much does it cost us, and what, how much space do they need, and what's it going to look like, and what type of service. Uh, one of the other questions is uh, for the insured or uninsured. And so, um, you know, we've, we've had conversation on that. Does a student have to prove that they have insurance? Uh, and then you file, you know, they would then file for the insurance claim. Um, I'm hesitant about doing that because um, I want all students to have the access, um, whether they've got insurance or not, and not to have to prove. Uh, and so we're, we're really looking at an open health care center um, that is not dependent on health insurance. I'm just going to say, since you were on that video on Friday for General Assembly, that means you're ACC famous now, right? So you can use that as your hashtag. hashtag yeah. <laughs> Other questions or comments or feedback? Yes. I can talk now. <laughs> Dr. Rich, you mentioned for the um, package for the 2022 bond, um, Southeast Travis County, Hayes, Pinnacle is also there, Yes. Right? Yeah. You know, uh, if, if you recall, we had a Pinnacle campus. Uh, mm -hmm. The building that's on the Pinnacle <coughs> campus was built as, um, I would say, probably um, C-class office space. And so the elevators were not adequate. Uh, the classroom space was not adequate. The, you know, the, how students got around in there. Plus, we started having problems with the stairwells, uh, that they were becoming unsafe. So we really had to just close it up um, and treat that as a land bank. And so that is I, what I consider a land bank. So phase one of the Pinnacle campus is also included in the south portion uh, of the 2022 bond issue. So we can open that back up. We have a question in the back. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you know, one, one of the things that, uh, if you take a look at um, most of our buildings on our campuses, uh, were built with the concept that we were only going to have uh, classrooms, labs, and office space, and not good open study space for students. Um, that we're getting away from probably seen it most at the Highland Campus. Um, but in all of the new buildings, that is what we're taking into consideration is you've got to have gathering spaces for students. Uh, we can't send the message by just having classrooms and offices. Come take your class and leave because we're not going to provide the space you need to study and to congregate and to work together in, in group. Um, that's a change. And so. Uh, all of the future buildings that you're going to see are going to have that type of space. At the Pinnacle campus? Uh, oh, Southeast Travis? Oh. <laughs> you want to make it all three? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, you know, one of the things that we've tried to do is if you take a look at the accelerator, uh, as Dr. Humphrey mentioned, um, you know, we've kind of used Highland as a test site, a prototype, and so that's where we had the first accelerator. Uh, but we've now been expanding the accelerators on multiple campuses. Not the same size, not 604 computer stations, but, you know, a couple hundred. So we continue to do that type of thing as well as, uh, you know, which incorporates the learning lab concept within that. Uh, so, they, but it also, means that students can come and stay, come as early as they want, stay as long as they want. Uh, I want to say thank you for putting nursing and health sciences in the bond package for Hayes. I think it's very needed. I think it'll make a 
difference for people who wouldn't have access otherwise. And so I'm very grateful for that. Thank you. Thanks, Wayne. Appreciate it. Anything else? So, oh, yeah. Hi, I'm Holly. Um, I was, at one time we had a campus or a site in San Marcos. And I was wondering if there's any discussion on moving further south in the future. Yes. Um, right now, I'm on the, um, I think they call it the Greater San Marcos Partnership, which is their economic development corporation, basically, for San Marcos and Buda and Kyle and a couple other communities. And uh, they are very interested in annexation. Uh, and so I think over the next two years, you're going to see a lot of conversation about the potential for annexation in the San Marcos. Um, that, you know, the vote, uh, I think it was back in 2010, uh, four different annexation elections were held. Uh, San Marcos and Bastrop were the two that lost, um, and the ones that won were uh, Elgin and Hayes. And so we're, we're in those conversations right now and talking about it. They are, uh, I would say they're, they're growing excitement especially as more industry is being located uh, in the San Marcos area. And so I think, I think you will probably see action. Uh, annexation has to happen as a result of the local community, uh, that it cannot be driven by the college. So they have to go out and they have to have 10% of the registered voters actually sign a petition. They give that petition to our board of trustees. Our board of trustees has to make sure that the signatures um, are uh, adequate and that uh, can be verified uh, as citizens of that either school district or, <coughs> or county or, or city. And that uh, then they, our trustees make the decision to put it on a ballot. And that can happen either in May or in November. And, uh, and then it gets voted on. Uh, but once again, um, you know, we're in a position where we can't advocate for it. Uh, it has to be a community groundswell. Uh, but I'm, I'm seeing that and we're providing information because that we can do that. So we can provide all the information uh, to make the case that uh, they need it uh, for industry growth. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for being here, first of all. Uh, secondly, in addition to childcare needs, I'm very mindful that our students, at least at the Hayes campus, have transportation needs. Is there any discussion around, <clears throat> excuse me, is there any discussion around at least regional transportation um, that could be provided if, say, Hayes didn't have enough space for a class and the student needed to go to Riverside? Yeah, one, one of the things that is taking place is CART. Um, actually, I was in a conversation last week that uh, you know, at one point in time they had, um, I think it was uh, Texas State actually provided bus service from San Mark from their campus um, almost into Austin. Um, and they did away with that. Uh, and I was in a conversation last week that it appears CART may be <coughs> taking that over. Um, and so that may be an avenue for it. Um, beyond that, I'm not sure what we can do. One other thing that is going on at the district, uh, we're uh, looking into some exploratory partnerships with some of the ride sharing companies like Lyft uh, to do some public private partnerships that way. So we're trying to be as creative as possible to come up with more solutions. We, again, we don't have all the answers yet, but we're trying to be as creative as possible to finding uh, innovative solutions and ways to support our students. I have a comment and a question. My name is David Duro and I'm the advising supervisor here at the Hayes campus. Um, APT president-elect, um, disabled veteran, and a husband of an employee, and I live in this community. My wife and I <laughs> live right across the street. 
So let me tell you a little bit about why that's so important. And I'm gonna nerd out a little bit. Um, so forgive me for just a minute. So we, when you think about a water droplet, and I'm, I'm gonna equate this to our business processes. So Pearl Harbor happened because somebody didn't see all of the airplanes because of water droplets, because radar frequencies match water droplets and it does all kinds of interesting things to radar. So somebody was fooled. So when, when you think of that, and I'm not gonna equate that disaster, but disaster is in the eyes of the beholder. So when something happens here, as far as our business processes at the institution, um, if I'm gonna give you an example, TSI. Let's say it doesn't get put into the system soon enough, that student starts that class, and then all of a sudden that student gets kicked out of that class or dropped from that class, and then we have this huge ripple effect and then Pearl Harbor happens. And that disaster is in the eyes of the beholder of the student. And then we, on that side, and I'm gonna say we as student affairs here locally on this campus, right, who care about our students and have what I call the usual suspects. There are students that come in all the time. Then that becomes a disaster that we have to spend an inordinate amount of time to then fix. So that's my comment. My question about that is, how are we continuing to formatively and summatively assess our business processes in order to make that better for our students? Can I jump in? Yeah. Okay, so uh, I love that analogy. When you say um, a disaster, uh, again, it's in the eye of the beholder, but for that student, it's absolutely nuclear. I mean, their world is turned upside down. They had a schedule, now they don't. Now they're not even sure, you know, they. What if they work all of their work schedule around this schedule and now everything is torn up? Everything, everything. there are all type of implications. So for us, it's understanding that we experience things individually yet collectively. For that one student, when we understand that their world is turned upside down, remember I started by saying, this is us trying to provide that Ritz Carlton type of experience for them. We need to think about for TSI processing that's an, how we apply that is an ACC policy. You know, there's some things that are codified by state laws, but then there are other things that we, we do it this way because this is how we do it at ACC. So this is an opportunity for us. That's just one example of the things when I talked about business process reengineering. Um, it's an opportunity for us to think about what is the best way for us to process this for our students across the district. Because what we don't want is uh, we do it this way at Hayes, we do it this way at Riverside, we do it this way at Round Rock, because that'll drive our students batty. So we've got to figure out, and that's why uh, with, I'll, I'll say that the ERP implementation is a great opportunity. Well, sometimes we call them problematunities. You know what I mean? We have some problems, but they're also opportunities. So we'll take this as a problematunity for us to really think critically about how we do everything. Because instead of just saying, uh, they call it BAU, business as usual, instead of just dumping BAU all over the place and yeah, that was easy, we got that done. I want us to be intentional. I want us to be really intentional about thinking, is this the right way to do it? Is this the right way to serve our students? It could be that collectively, like I said, we've got some of the smartest people in the world. Why don't we use this collective brain power to think about what is the right way to serve our students? What is the best way to think about TSI processing? I, I, my mind was blown when I realized that we had people in our, you know, I talked about that enrollment funnel. We have, a, we have a, not just a fiduciary responsibility, ethically, we have a responsibility to serve everybody in our service area that wants to be served. So we have to remove our own barriers that we've created. And a lot of them, we were well-meaning and we thought, you know, it'll be really good and it'll serve the students. But sometimes 20 years gives you a little perspective and allows you to see some of those raindrops a little bit better and more clearly. Maybe we have better sonar or LIDAR that wasn't available in 1942. So we can apply that to each situation. Are we leveraging technology? Now, again, my background is technology, but I don't believe that technology is the panacea. What's amazing is our humanity, and we have to have students focus on their humanity because it's our humanity that differentiates us from computers. AI can be applied to anything. 
And so I want us to think about it in a broader sense to address your question. We want to apply technology and AI on anything that's tedious and repetitive. But anything that requires creativity requires our humanness. All right? We've got some amazing people in this room. And you're amazing because of everything that you've been through and your lived experiences. So when we apply the lived experiences, your experiences with our students, the things that you know about our students, then the new processes that we develop should be, you know, so I want our new implementation to be world class. And so, you know, if when I found out that we have people in our enrollment funnel that have degrees, but we're waiting because we need more time to process how they scored on TSI, why? They've already, they've already earned a college degree. But we had some things because of the way it was set up. It's just an opportunity, a problemutunity, for us to think about how we do everything. You know, the other is that uh, you know, it gives us opportunities to lobby uh, at the state level. Um, because if you take a look at high stakes testing, and is it really the best way for determining whether a student is college ready or not? Uh, the data will reveal that it's not. High stakes tests are not the best way to determine that. It's GPAs, it's high school GPAs, it's recommendations. There are multiple factors that can be taken and should be taken into consideration and not just a high stakes test. And so, um, you know, TSI is basically acuplacer based development of a previous uh, test that, um, you know, uh, we've got to get beyond. I think. Uh, so we'll be continuing to work on multiple measures for student opportunity. Hi. Hi. Um, my name is Whitney, and I am the intake specialist. So I work at the Welcome Center and I'm the front person for our students. I'm, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I'm also um, the president of the intake forum for all across all districts. And I appreciate what you were saying, Dr. Humphrey. Uh, but I was wondering, uh, is there, in more specific language, uh, plans in place to create relationships across departments where there is actual cohesiveness? We were, uh, in our forum um, representatives meeting, um, I had uh, Cynthia Ott from Eastview. She was like, is there actually a a spreadsheet that shows how each department like funnels through each other and I was like I don't know but that's a good project we could work on for this year uh, but it specifically so that we are not having different cultures created at different campuses and that our processes are the same so that students experience I can tell you from I can just rattle off for hours stories of students that have different experiences at different campuses um, and we have specific students that come here for their student affairs needs because they won't go to other campuses because they've had bad experiences could you specifically tell me what your options are or what we're doing there actively I think you just described a problematicity you know, um, and just being honest, I, you're not going to find me sugarcoating anything. Uh, what we're finding is uh, just what you said. So I'm not going to, as an institution, I said we're a learning institution. Once we're aware of something, you can't unsee it. So once things are brought to our attention, that's when we have to say, okay, how do we address this? And so I think the timing is good. It's dovetailing in with the need for an SIS upgrade. So. Uh, what I'm working on with the student affairs and uh, the provost council is the creation of our work groups to look at our business processes and that will allow us to have those affinities across our locations because we have to do that as part of our business process reengineering. So, um, you know, the timeline for ERP implementation, it's not six months, but there's uh, one thing that I remind people for us to do this well. And you know, I, I take Dr. Rhodes' charge seriously. We will. I want this to be the best SIS implementation in the galaxy. But to do that, there's a considerable amount of pre-work. So Dr. Rhodes mentioned my time at Bridgestone. Little key, little fun fact. I mentioned my trip to Venezuela. I went to Venezuela because we were implementing an ERP globally, and I had the fun job of being the project manager for our global implementations. So I had to do 
the work to launch our first ERP in Venezuela, Argentina, Costa Rica, Brazil, and Mexico. And we spent a year with data integrity to make sure, has anybody ever looked up a student and saw eight different addresses or eight different phone numbers? That's when you have bad data. That's a common problem. We don't want to import a whole bunch of bad data into the system. Things like that, things like the business process reengineering, being, being intentional about ensuring that our processes are standardized across the district will help us have a good implementation. All of that requires pre-work, but it's exactly what you're saying. So we're starting now to form those teams. We're on the early stages. The fact that you saw it means you're innovative. So I'm going to ask that, not that you're voluntold, but I would like if you have an interest that when we pass out the sign-up sheets, I would love for you to help us yeah. with this. Thank you. You know, one of one of the books that uh, I've asked the uh, cabinet to read right now is a book called Trust and Inspire by Stephen Covey. Uh, and so I would I would um, actually suggest that you know if, if you have the opportunity to read that book. Uh, but really, you know, one of the things that it's really talking about is unleashing the power of our employees. Everybody who works here to use their innovation creativity and for us to trust that they will uh, move forward with the right answers to, you know, for the right reasons. Have you read that? I haven't read it, but I've read it. Okay. okay. This is the actually the son. Uh, oh, that's right. Steve, yeah. Yeah. how to win for friends and influence yeah. people. One thing I'll say as a, a follow-up to what Dr. Rhodes said, just as you just identified that, I wanna be very explicit. If you are working with students, whatever role you're in, you are an expert at what you do. You know, Malcolm Gladwell says to be an expert, you have to spend at least 10,000 hours doing something. If you spent 10,000 hours or more doing that, we need your expertise. If you see something and you're like, those dumb people at Highland don't know what they're doing and they should do this. And I know you would never say that, but uh, <laughs> if you see something that we are not doing in the most effective or efficient way at the college, whether it's at this college or across the district, don't feel like you don't have the right to say it. Please share it. Because just like that insight, those are ways for us to get better. I said we're a learning institution. How do we learn together? We collectively come together to what? Co-create our future. We don't have to inherit some mess somebody else created. We don't have to, in uh, industry, they call it tech debt, your old software solutions. If you've had 40 years of old systems, at a certain point, it's tech debt because you have to keep maintaining it. We have the benefit of saying, we can create whatever processes we want in the future. You know, held to state laws and policies and procedures. But there's a lot of flexibility in how we do what we do. But we need your help. It can't just be me and Dr. Rhodes. It can't be the Brett show, it can't be the Jess show. It's gotta be all of us <laughs> together, working together. But together, we're pretty amazing. We have one more question here. Was there anyone else before we get ready to wrap up with the last question? Okay, then I will hand it to you. Hey, um, so my name is Jill. I work here in testing full time, um, but importantly, I'm also a student. I'm a biology student, um, and I do appreciate Dr. Um for your mention of um, neurodivergency within the students. Um, I am a neurodivergent student. I uh, struggle with depression, OCD, um, autistic um, symptoms, and um, I wanted to ask. I know you know Rome wasn't built in a day, so this is more of an open-ended type. Um, conversation starter. Um, but similar to what was brought up earlier about um, bringing health care to students who um, may not have that um, accessible to them, um, I wanted to know if there was any discussion or any plans in ensuring that students have accessibility and accommodations for them to be able to learn properly even if they don't have the access to um, a proper diagnosis by a healthcare professional. Um, I work very closely with um, the SAS department, and so um, you know we see a lot of students who do take tests with accommodations, but in order to get those accommodations, you know, 
Um, you, of course, have to have a diagnosis by a medical professional. You have to speak with an SAS advocate. And not everybody has access to um, a healthcare professional to reach those needs. So um, I didn't know if there could be um, any sort of training opportunities for faculty members um, to make them aware of um, you know, different accessibility options. So there are two parts to that. Uh, I'm, I'm proud to say, after talking to our Access Autism group, uh, they already set up a series of professional development for faculty that's actually led by the students to increase awareness and help faculty understand um, just from a glossary perspective and understanding and increased awareness. Uh, that's one. The second part, I, I don't like to speak outside of my area of expertise. Do we have any ADA uh, experts that can speak to where we are on that? Anybody in the room know the specifics on that one? We work with students who have documentation, and we can also work with those who don't at this point okay. in time. That's helpful. So uh, please connect. We, we definitely yeah. want the students to reach out. And my thing is, if we don't have something currently, I need them to reach out so we can start creating it if we don't. And like I told our Access Autism group, I was happy. Uh, we took pictures together yeah. on Friday. I said, challenge me. I want somebody to ask me for support that I don't know how to do. I want to be have to work with Dr. Rhodes to come up with a creative solution to something. Challenge me, please. Uh, we're here to serve our students, so how do we do that together? So I uh, hope that is a better answer. We want to make sure that our students do reach out, and if there's something that we're not currently doing and there's a gap, we'll try to figure out how to close the gap. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Thank you. You know, one, one last thing that I'll mention too is I am so, as the chancellor, I'm so proud of you all and what the work you're doing. Um, you know, it was, when I came here 11 years ago, I don't know if you remember the billboard that, that came up and said, ACC graduation rate 4%, is this a good use of taxpayer money? Um, well, I'm proud to say we are the fastest growing um, increase in graduation rates of any community college in the state of Texas. Um, we, you know, we're not satisfied with where we are, but we've gone from, actually it wasn't 4%, it was 3.9%, but we've gone from 3.9% to 23% our graduation rate. We've still got a long ways to go, but we are now in the top uh, portion of graduation rate. That doesn't happen just by saying we want to improve it means that every single person is dedicated to making a difference uh, and looking for ways to improve uh, how we help our students be successful. Um, you know, and so I, I just so greatly appreciate all that you've done um, you know, in the last 10, 11 years to make that happen. So keep up the good work. And like Brett just announced, you know, people in the community recognize ACC is a great place. Um, students recognize that. I think we're up to 20 to 25 percent of our students already have bachelor's degrees. They're coming back to ACC to get the skill sets necessary to get good jobs. Thank you all for your okay. questions. Thanks.